The treaty debates are definitely the most important conversation we had with ourselves in the 20th century. The beginning of our independence as a state, which was fraught in all kinds of ways, but still a huge, huge moment for the Irish people. And they have been there lurking in the background that people often refer to them in different ways for many, many years. The decade of centenaries, which has been dedicated in many ways to giving us evidence of what was happening uh, during that very tumultuous time, gave an opportunity for the treaty debates to be staged. But it was never inevitable that they would be. Um, I myself have dreamed of seeing the treaty debates produced in dramatic form. There was a movie about it with Brendan Gleeson playing Michael Collins back in the 90s, which was grand, but not long enough. Uh, and I thought this decade would definitely be the chance to do it. I had read the debates myself as a young woman in the special edition that was produced by the stationery office in the 60s or 70s, I think, and was absolutely struck by the drama and the tragedy, the essentially dramatic nature of what was going on with, with these extraordinary people, and they were extraordinary people. So when we get to the decade of centenaries, Theo, you and I ended up talking about it. You had had a similar idea, and were actually working on trying to cut the gigantic number of words down to a manageable level. And I thought nobody better to do this, because I knew you would be very, very careful with it, that you would be fair to, to all involved, that you would make sure the arguments were presented in a balanced way so nobody got the better of anybody else in the sense of how it would be presented. And when we chatted, uh, I thought, Louise Lowe, Anu, are the people to do this. I'd had the privilege of working with Anu for some years before that on, on various projects connected with the decade of centenaries. And it had been a pure joy to look at the talent, the genius, the absolute fidelity to evidence displayed by Anu in the things they did about very, very difficult issues. Uh, for example, civilian casualties in 1916. Nobody else really dramatized that in the way that they did. And they also do everything in a very innovative and interesting way. So I, bless me, put the two of you together. Love at first sight, off you go. And I had the good fortune to see the results of uh, some of that fantastic collaboration last night, uh, brought to life by 45 extraordinary actors and actresses. Uh, and I am still reeling from the effect of it. And all of it happened in this room, which is the very room where the actual debates took place. What could be more magical than that? So I left last night with a mixture of elation and deep melancholy elation because I'd seen something done as well as it possibly could be that really matters to our country in terms of its history and melancholy because the tragedy of the Civil War is approaching, it, approaching us at the end of that debate. Uh, and we all, I think, went out into the, the, the hall just stunned by what we had seen. You know, you use two words there that I think are really important, fidelity yeah. and magical. The I was very struck in 2016 by, in a sense, the leadership given by Michael D. Higgins when he said, we do not apologize for what made us what we are. We acknowledge it, no matter what we think we might have done or said, and we move on. But we ask ourselves the question the insurgents asked and everybody who fought for Irish independence before us is, who do we want to be? And we live in such an information-saturated time now that it requires an act of magic to connect people to their own history and even to the present moment. And I was very moved by the number of personal family testimonies that came out during the 2016 things. I was, you know, reflecting on that. I was commissioned to write a poem about Elizabeth of Harlem, in the course of which I discovered that she had absented herself from that famous photograph. She wasn't airbrushed out of history. She, made, she exercised her own agency because she said it would not help our cause to have our general accompanied by a nurse confronting their general. And besides, she says, I knew the war would go on. I did not think it would be helpful for the enemy to have my photograph. So that shift from her being a passive victim of airbrushing to her exercising her own agency, that was a, a seminal moment for me. That and the family testimonies. And I was aware, I said, you know, this is nothing compared to how we're going to have to face into remembering 
the Civil War, not commemorating, but remembering. And I thought, well, why not take it back to where, to the flashpoint where everything that we are now became made naked, and that was in the treaty debates. And I kind of start, I opened it up, opened up the file online, and oh dear God, 440,000 words, impossible. But I said, I have a go at it. Cut, it ended up cut back to 100,000. But then there's the problem of how do you stage it? Mm -hmm. And I was thinking in very conventional theatrical terms, and I thought, people won't connect to it. And then I'd been sort of building up an enormous, what is by now an enormous admiration for the a new way of making theatre. And it suddenly struck me that if you could do this as it was and let them, they all speak in their own words, there's not a word in the text of this added, not one. And once I got over the difficulty of ensuring that I could be fair to both sides, I thought, how do you open the drama? And you have to take people there. And we did think of doing it in, in different ways. And then when you popped up as the guardian angel of the production and introduced Louise and myself, and suddenly the whole thing began to just generate lift. I mean, it was like a Saturn rocket trembling on the ground as it slowly builds up power to take off. And of course, the key idea was to do it here, in this room, where the actual debate took place. So you're offering people quite an extraordinary experience, a very convincing descent down into the dark, down into the past, an absolutely convincing, immersive experience. But the audience is coming also, knowing what didn't happen and what did happen of what was predicted. So people are predicting the Union Jack will fly over Dublin Castle. Uh, the army of the free state will be British soldiers and so on. So you have this double consciousness when you're here. What really struck me, and last night, at, in the great silence, which was a brilliant idea to have a long silence there, nobody moved. And we were, so many of us were in tears. And all I kept thinking was, my poor country. My poor country. And everything they argued about in the treaty debates is still a live issue. Partition, the question of reconciliation with the North, a relationship with a supranational association of states, all of these things are live. And I suddenly realized what we are doing is opening a wound which has never been healed. As many people died in the Civil War as died in the War of Independence, we killed our own. And you're there, and you believe it's de Valera, you believe it's Cosgrave, you believe it's Mick Collins, you believe it's Mrs. Pierce, it's Mary McSweeney. And you're thinking, they are going to be trying to kill each other in a very short time. And you're asking yourself, why? How did it come to this? And for me, the genius of the production is you watch the disintegration of comradeship. They come in, and the first question is, how did the delegation break? Yeah. The delegation was sent with plenty of potentiary powers. They signed a treaty, but it is not a treaty until it is ratified by the Doyle. And what ends up, it ends up with is the plenty potentiaries are effectively put on trial. Not once in the entire debate does anybody say what a republic is. It's not in our constitution. We do not describe ourselves as a Republican. It was kind of almost semi-flippantly described as a Republican, 48, 49, but we never actually asked, what is this Republic to be? Only two glancing references are made to the democratic program of 1919, which is the sacred duty of the Doyle. And what you're doing, you're present as the lost opportunities disclose themselves. You are, and it's uh, one thing I suppose we, we need to remember is that this is a very young and inexperienced parliament. Average the age average 32? Average age is 32, yeah. I think, yeah. or 35. Um, they're young people. Most of them have never been in a parliament before Doyle Aaron, uh, because, of course, in 1918, the parliamentary party is wiped out by Sinn Féin. They become a government on the run. They don't have opportunities to meet and, and make policy, and there's no normal uh, parliamentary business going on at all until we get to this point. 
uh, when the truce happens and uh, we, they move through the negotiations. So uh, right through the debates, it's sprinkled with issues about parliamentary procedure and can I do this or say that, and which is boring for people, and you've kept it down to the bare minimum, which is really clever of you. Um, they don't really know how they should proceed. And then you have, it's, one of the things that fascinates me most is De Valera saying in the, in the last session, I'm sick of politics. He's the consummate politician in the room. You know, even before this, he, he, he thinks politically all the time. He's a natural born politician. And, he, and that's a sort of a tantrum that he's throwing, saying that he's not interested in the very thing that of course he ends up spending his life doing for many, many years later. Um, the emotion builds up like a sort of pressure cooker uh, and must have done so at the time. I think that's a really fair reflection of what it's like. They're not talking, as you said, Theo, about the democratic program of the Doyle. They're not talking about what kind of country will we be. Mm. They're talking about the scaffolding of it. And the scaffolding relates to sovereignty. The notion of an oath to the king is what gives pause to a whole lot of people. It becomes a rhetorical time bomb in the middle of the discussions, that this must be dealt with. This is impossible. We cannot take an oath to the King of England. That's going to kill us. The other side, pragmatically, are saying, we can manage this because it's going to give us much more than we... Certainly, it's far more than they would have got under the Third Home Rule Bill, we have to remember. Much, much more. Uh, so they're making that pragmatic argument. Pragmatism in the face of absolute idealism is always, or usually, doomed to fail. Because idealism is so powerful, so rhetorical, so emotional, so convincing in so many ways. And, you know, when it, when it comes to the point of the vote, people on the pro-treaty side thought they had lost. Yeah. They actually believed that the eloquence and conviction of the anti-treaty side had won the day and that they were going to be moving, presumably still, into war of some sort. What kind of war, uh, we will never know. Um, so it's that emotional pressure cooker over these long days, before and after Christmas, in the winter as well, which matters. Yeah. It's cold outside. People are coming in with their hats and scarves and coats, as they did last night here, uh, in out of the cold to this warm room too, which probably got too warm, um, given that it's ceiling height and all the rest of it, uh, for, for people in a state of heated debate. They move around freely. They go straight up to each other. Harry Boland at one point goes straight up to Michael Collins, his best friend until recently. Best you said the disintegration of comradeship, and that is so sad. And there are moments when you think, why can't they work this out? Isn't that the thing? Why can't they work it out? It, and it's, it's interesting. And the staging very ingeniously mirrored this. They start out on day one, mm -hmm. all mixed in together. Um, and when they're starting to get heated, they're kind of half apologizing to the person next to them who's of a different view. Yeah. And then bit by bit by bit, they start forming sides. And there's an interest, there's a psychological trigger in that, that you stop listening mm -hmm. as you become more and more committed to taking a side. That's right. And it ends up as Dublin versus Kerry. You know, it doesn't matter what the quality of the game is, your side must win. And there, there's an, an important intervention by Owen McNeil, as to speak, where he makes three very practical suggestions. And there isn't time to think about it because they don't want to hear it. They move on. Michael Collins proposes a resolution. You step back, in other words, abstain, let us pass it, and then we'll fight it out, the politics of it. And what Collins has in the back of his mind, of course, is this is continuing the war by other means. Um, but they don't hear him. He makes this intervention. Dev is really interested. The politician in Dev is yes. seeing, and he's not just seeing the move, but he's suddenly realizing that Collins is an able politician as well. But they move on straight away to something else. And you keep thinking of lost opportunities. Would people not step back and listen to the other side? And I think that was the value of, the whole value of doing this is saying, you may have inherited a prejudice, you may have inherited a stance, a world historical stance towards something that happened 101 years ago, but stop and think in the present moment and ask Lenin's great question from 1917, what is to be done? And the underlying question, who do we want to be? That's right. People are talking about, you know, if necessary, we'll take on orangeism. And in the back of my mind is 100,000 rifles. Yeah. You are facing 100,000 rifles with 4,000. 
Lads, get a grip. Constance Markovitz's airy dismissal of the idea of total war. Mm. I mean, do they not know what has been happening on the Western Front? Mm. The day-long, week-long, month-long, year-long, artil non-stop artillery barrages. The answer to that is probably no, no. because they've been in their own <coughs> bubble. Yeah. And now they're in another bubble, yeah. uh, and, this, uh, and the bubble is about sovereignty. It's about, it's not necessarily what kind of country do we want to be, but what would be the infrastructure, the sovereignty infrastructure for it, and yeah. that goes directly to the oath. Now, De Valera, as we all know, signed the oath in 1927, when he goes into the Doyle yeah. as the leader of Fianna Fáil. And uh, the clerk of the Doyle years ago told me, and I haven't seen it, that uh, the way he did it was because he signed the Doyle register and at the top of the page was the oath the of fidelity, yeah. not allegiance, to the king. That he closed his eyes, crossed his fingers behind his back and signed it. Yeah. And that the, the signature goes right off the page. That is superstition and duplicity and all kinds of things yeah. along with it. De Valera is an incredibly complex and interesting character in Irish history for many, many decades afterwards. Poor Michael Collins is not, neither is Arthur Griffith. Mm. And Griffith's speech at the end of the debates is one of the most marvellous acts of oratory that I've ever seen. I'm so delighted it's been resurrected and done so well in ah, this so production. But one of the issues that he is focusing on, it becomes the issue of the civil war in many ways, is the legitimacy of democracy. The Doyle, and de Valera says it at a certain point, this is the supreme forum for the people where decisions are taken. That is not a view held by others who believe that actually the military men who fought the War of Independence are the ones who should be making decisions mm. about the future. There's that, there's that whole question of legitimacy, as you rightly say. When de Valera says that this is the supreme forum for democracy, he's saying, but... but the established republic, and that's code for the republic declared in 1916, which is the, the genesis of the claim to authority of the physical force movement. And you have this stark contrast between those who fetishize the army um, and derive legitimacy from the continuing existence of an army, and those who are struggling to establish a democracy. And, you know, of course without an armed insurrection, which certainly did not have the authority of the people. Um, you would not have arrived at the treaty debates, so to speak. But equally, you cannot build a state on those foundations. So you have idealism taking primacy over practicalities, and your practicality taking primacy over idealism, but they're both, both sides are pragmatic in their own spheres of thinking, and both sides are equally idealistic. One of the things the treaty debates is closest is everybody in the room was a Republican. Mm -hmm. The problem is nobody knows, nobody what, knows a what a Republic is. is. That's true. Nobody defines it, and we still haven't. Yeah. I often think, I mean, I've argued for years that if you would really like to see this island functioning as a single interconnected political unit, the best thing we can do is build an actual Republic in the 26 counties and then have a set of criteria for joining us. You know, say if you, if you were prepared to stop killing each other, stop insecurity and blah, blah, you can join our republic. And the opportunity to build a real republic is still here. It's still possible. I mean, you could go back and find the blueprint for it in the democratic program. We could. We have all sorts of options, many of which we don't take. Well, one is but we could actually put a clause in the Constitution declaring ourselves a republic and declaring what the, the moral basis of all legislation in the Republic should be. I think if we get to the point where we have that debate, which should happen when we revise the Constitution or create a new one, something you've been a proponent of for, yeah, for quite yeah. some time, we're definitely ready for a new Constitution yes, in this country. Absolutely. When, when constitutions are over amended, it's time to start again. Arguably, yeah. the American Constitution should be thrown in the bin and a whole new thing started, but good luck with that. Similarly here, it'll be interesting to see if there will be a debate about what a republic might actually be. Uh, using wonderful people like Philip Pettit, our own homegrown philosopher of republicanism, yeah. who has a lot to say about what are the philosophical but pinnings look, of a republic. Ten years ago or so, I edited a collection of essays towards um, Cornerstone, towards a, a constitution for a 21st century republic. Uh, political figures, uh, eminent specialists in constitutional law, and it's a very readable book. Mm -hmm. 
zero reviews that book got. Yeah. I looked around for the four nights of this production, and to the best of my knowledge, there was not a single TD or senator here present. Well, shame on them, well, as Mary McSweeney might say. Yes, indeed. But it tells me, I was very taken with how young the audience for the production was, by and large. That was really interesting to me. But we, we seem to want, at all costs, to avoid the big issues. When you consider the colossal issues mm -hmm. that they faced during the treaty debate, and they rose to the issues, and when you consider how paltry and mean-spirited our level of official public debate is, I mean, there has never been a debate in Doyle Learn in my lifetime that dealt with as substantial issues as that. No, never. And that's why I say it's the most important conversation yes. we have ever had with ourselves and why it is so important that we can see it yeah. in this marvellous production. And I really wish that the whole country could see it because I think it would benefit us enormously. It's a brilliant starting point yeah. because it's difficult. But we Politics are difficult. Yeah. The whole business of, of, of gaining independence from the state was incredibly difficult. We made it more difficult for ourselves by rushing headlong really into a civil war that need not have happened. No. If you want to get here, don't start from there. And basically. we would we need to hear the well, we stories. Need to think about we that. need to hear the stories of the people yeah. who actually fought in the war of independence and stood aside from the civil war on the grounds I could not shoot the men I fought for. That's right. And there that's, were very yeah. many of those. There were and yeah. that would that's an in a whole undisclosed chapter as well. And we know. also need to know what ordinary people around the country thought and we've got a fair idea about this now. What was it? Eighty percent voted to accept it? Seventy eight percent the, the June the sixteenth, Bloomsday nineteen twenty two is the date of the general election yeah. on the treaty. And seventy eight percent voted for pro-treaty parties, 22% yeah. for mm. the um, anti-treaty side. Yeah. That was a mandate to the government yeah. to, to implement the treaty. People but, were sick of war, they were tired of it, they'd had enough, and certainly the, the, the behaviour of the anti-treaty forces uh, during the civil war put huge strain on the countryside because they had to take to guerrilla war in the second half mm. of it, which meant they were living on the land and commandeering things and taking food from shops and from homes and doing all of that kind of stuff. People had had enough of that at that mm. stage. But the atrocities on both sides, yeah. after the murder of Hales and yeah. the judicial murder yeah. of four prisoners of war, yeah. uh, it descended into barbarism. And people were under the cloak of the Civil War, they were settling old scores, they, they were, were fighting for farm. The number of women who were sexually assaulted and raped during the Civil War, far larger as far as, even though the evidence is only beginning to emerge, yes. from the, the vaults of family shame, mm -hmm. they're coming out into the open, far worse than during the War of Independence. We did worse to ourselves than the Tans ever did to us. Mm -hmm. And that's a sobering thought. But I, I want to say something about this production as well. Because I, I, I started thinking, as I, I had the privilege of sitting in on the, on the rehearsals and watch the extraordinary magic of one woman, you know, bringing 45 actors to a single text and breaking through. It was extraordinary. But what I was thinking is, this is, this is, the, this is classical Greek drama, mm -hmm. where every year in the Herodion, underneath the, 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 the Parthenon, the city of Athens would gather. And they would be given a tragedy, usually comedies as well, but they would be given a tragedy which encapsulated the great issues the city was facing. And that catharsis between play and audience you know, guided the city into the next phase of its, of its political life and its social life. And for all that, Athens was based on slavery. It was, it was the beginnings of And there the were no women at the theatre. Absolutely. Yeah. But for all of that, and that is, you know, 2,000 years ago, um, and we have moved on somewhat. I'm not convinced we've moved anywhere near far enough. But that hey, we have dentists now. That yeah, does make a difference. Uh, okay, right. But that cathartic, sacred moment, to have that happen here, in this room where it happened, was, was the most extraordinary theatrical experience of my life. But that's what a new does, is it looks at the evidence that's available. It doesn't try to trick act or dress it up or do any yeah. of that stuff that you're often tempted to do because reality is messy. Yeah. The treaty debates were messy. Yeah. And they come across in that way beautifully. The beautiful mess mm. is what we get. Mm. And that's the value of this because it is utterly trustworthy to its bedrock. Mm. Everyone who was here 
over those four nights uh, finishing last night knew that what they were watching was accurate, that the representations of those people by the actors was as accurate and close to who they were as was possible to get. Including the lacuna and the arguments, people might That's think right. it's because it was cut down. No, yeah. people did move. Somebody makes an impassioned speech and asks a question mm -hmm. and the next speaker talks about something completely yeah. different. Yeah. They don't realise you're expected to answer to that, you know. Yeah. So there are all these disjunctions yeah. In the thing. And as you said earlier, it's because this is a state struggling to be born. That's right. And it's in the hands of people with little experience of statecraft, little or none. Um, but they have to make moments. They're forgetting, it, it, it breaks my heart to think all the way through they're forgetting that treaties are made between sovereign political That's entities. Right. That's right. Whether you call it a state or a kingdom or whatever, that Ireland has already gained that status. It is the first of the colonies to treat with Britain. And that momentous fact gets lost in petty parochialisms and vicious conflicts of ego. I mean, I'd read and I'd known for a long time about Cahill Brewer's famous speech yeah. against Collins. And to see the, the roots and personal jealousy and vindictiveness of that brilliantly brought. Life. It was brilliantly brought to light. And but it, Seamus it, Robinson. Seamus Robinson. I hadn't come oh across my him. God. Can anyone ever can anyone show that Mr. Michael Collins ever fired a shot at an enemy of Ireland? Uh, Jimmy, it was in the GPO, you yeah. know. It was extraordinary stuff. But those two speeches probably flipped the balance for the undecided in many ways. Mm. There were four or five TDs who didn't really make their minds up until the very last minute. Mm. And there were at least two or three who went home at Christmas time, spoke to their constituents and changed their minds, uh, anti-treaty TDs, mm. who switched to the other side because their constituents said, sign the goddamn treaty. We're sick of war. Yeah. This is good enough. And you have to remember the common sense of ordinary people will always be more towards good enough yeah. than striving towards some unachievable ideal. The, the Roche it's going to cause that death. Out. Yeah. yeah. You know, De Roche is the only one who remembers enough about the ordinary life of Ireland to realise that a lot of people are illiterate. So all over the country, the habit of the day is, yeah. and it happened in my grandfather's time, somebody reads the Cork Examiner out to a circle of people who can't themselves read, and then there's a mini local parliament to discuss and tease out the issues very slowly, very ruminatively. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where you get the bedrock political truth. Yeah. And he's trying to say, these are the people we serve, but these are also the people we must listen to. Mm -hmm. And it's extraordinary too to see, like De Valera, for instance, saying four times he would obey the democratic mandate of the Doyle, yes. and within and minutes not. of yeah. the vote being taken, there will be a meeting for, our, for all those who cannot accept this decision. Like Self-absenting yourself from the life of the nation is the I think he of this knew country. later on that it was one of the greatest mistakes of his life. Absolutely. He also didn't realise that he would lose control so quickly of the anti-treaty side, which he mm. did. Yeah. The military men took over very swiftly yeah. and it became, you know, Rory O'Connor, for example, said more or less what he wanted was a military dictatorship yeah. while sitting in the forecourts. And we very nearly had, I mean, there's, a, there's that moment where, for instance, I mean, this brings so much memory, Collins saying, you know, you, you would rule as a junta. Mm -hmm. And yet, de facto, at one stage in the Civil War, Collins and the IRB Council are running a junta yes. through the Parliament. So there was an awful lot still to be unpicked and opened out. And that's why I say a lot of it isn't dealt with. But they themselves weren't dealing with all the issues that were in play either. No, they couldn't. No. It becomes brother against brother in the most awful way. And the six women, of course, all of them anti-treaty. Yeah. Four of them terribly bereaved. Yeah. Kathleen Clark lost her husband and her brother. Yeah. Mary McSweeney lost her, her brother to hunger strike, 70 day hunger strike in Brixton jail. Um, Kate O'Callaghan saw her husband murdered before her yeah. at her home. And Mrs. Pierce, of course, the, the, the mother of Ireland with her two sons, who are going to haunt her, she says, if she votes for, for this treaty. They're not necessarily representative women. And in some ways, they begin a tradition of women TDs who are connected to male predecessors, which goes on for a very long time in the, the Doyle mm, mm. after the Civil War is over. Uh, but they're all very interesting. And of course, Mary Maxine makes her speech for two hours and 40 minutes. She's a fantastic orator. She's incredibly eloquent. It's really interesting. We think to listen to her, many of the time didn't think so. 
two hours and 40 minutes does bespeak a pretty large ego, by far the longest speech made during the course of the treaty. Made on the 21st of December, the shortest day of the year, 1921, she stops at seven o'clock. Had she stopped at five o'clock or six o'clock, they could have had a vote that day. But the anti-treaty the side would have won. The anti-treaty side would have won. So Mary was not being strategic. Mm. She was indulging herself. Well, you could say she was indulging herself, but she was deeply traumatized. She spent 74 days sitting by her brother's side. She did. As he starved to yeah. death. No, I get and, it. And I understand no, but, that. No, but I'm just saying that that was brought out in the performance, even though she objected to having her personal experiences dragged into That's the right. debate. I think she got that hearing because people felt such human sympathy for her. But as a performance of the text, it was absolutely, the effect on the audience was mesmeric. Mm -hmm. People are completely swept up her. And then suddenly she talks about the annihilation of this and the next and the next generation. But sometime in the future, the Republic will arise. And people are saying, Really? Who's going to do the dying here? And remember, There's that marvellous the, the, the phrase where someone says, the earth belongs to those on it, not under it. That's right. And Arthur Griffith, in his final speech, says, this living generation has a right to live for itself. Yeah. We cannot consign them to mm. further death. Yeah. And that is it's the exact opposite of what McSweeney is advocating. If they exterminate the men, the women will rise up. If they exterminate the women, the children are rising fast. If they exterminate the children, the blades of grass dyed with their blood will spring up like the dragon's teeth yeah. as armed men. One TD says she would not leave us even a grasshopper. I know. Which the grasshoppers would be dyed in blood too. Yeah, but, it, else, but it was interesting too, though, to see figures who have been forgotten in the shorthand histories mm -hmm. that we have coming through, like Seamus Robinson's yeah. viciousness about Collins. Didn't he end up running the OPW? As far as I know, he was an OPW commissioner later on. Yeah. And he, I think he was one of the assessors for military service pensions, uh -huh. which were very important. Uh, which were very, so often visual. denied to women. That's right. Well, were until 1934, yeah. I think, yeah. was when Dev. And Milroy comes, comes, Milroy comes up. Sean Etchingham yeah. is probably the, um, the, the recruiting sergeant for, the typical recruiting sergeant for generations mm -hmm. of you know, IRA militants yes. ever since. Yes, it's, it, there's just one narrow road and that's the road. It, it, it's, I'm still, you know, the honest truth is I'm still absorbing this. It's one thing to sit in front of a text and cut it down and cut it down, hope you're being fair to everybody and trying very hard to be. And you were. But I had the exact same experience sitting in this room through those performances that anybody else who walked in the door yeah. and was in the audience. I'd given over to history, given over to the past, with the hypercritical sense that we have in the present. That's not going to happen. That will happen. You're wrong about this. Oh, Jesus, don't say that. You know, it's extraordinary. No, it's utterly absorbing. And I grew up in an anti-treaty household. My father was a great de Valera man, uh, hence me getting the debates with a certain slant on the debates yeah. when I was young. But and I, I've since changed my mind. I believe that the, the pro-treaty side was the democratic side that was ratified by the election in, in 1922. And I believe that was the, the rational thing to do. But I would have been very fierily on the side of Mary McSweeney and the rest of them when I was younger. And I've turned against that now. But last night, when Dev moves down the, the, the hall here, close to where Mary McSweeney is sitting, and he is waving the copy of the treaty in the air, and he announces that, that signing this would be a betrayal of Terence McSweeney and the ideas that he died for. And Mary gets up from her seat and shakes his hand. And I just started to cry. I thought, look, you know, they're, they're, she has suffered this extraordinary loss. She adored her brother. And she sat, as you said, with him for all those, those, uh, those days to watch him die. And it's a horrible death, death by hunger yeah. strike. And she loved De Valera. And De Valera was very good and interested in Mary McSweeney throughout the rest of her life, mm. even though they disagreed on all kinds of fundamentals. They were close. And you just think this is what it's come to, that the, the attrition that's been suffered by so many of these people has either made them think, we have to stop this now, we have to take the best we can get, or to think, 
is that what we died for, what they died for? The is bit, this enough? And the bit that's not her, at the stage, we're so late into the proceedings that they're not listening to each other anymore. And one deputy, I forget who it was now, I should think I'd remember, says, this is not forever. Yeah. This is not forever. And her writer was, look at all the things the anti-treaty side feared that did not come to, to, to pass. Yeah. And look at all the things we just quietly let drop and Britain affected not to notice that we let them drop. They were not interested in enforcing things that we were letting drop. And that single thing, to say that single thing, this is not forever. Yeah. But of course, in the heat of debate, they're dealing with absolutes at, by the end. High and principle versus ordinary, pragmatism. decent pragmatism. And yet they have forgotten by the end of the day what they reassure each, each other about for days one, two, three, up to day four. We are all Republicans here. We are all one party. Until they're not. One of the interesting things, Theo, and you, I'm sure you, you, you notice this, the North doesn't feature. Now, we know how that is because the Government of Ireland Act in 1920 has already established the Northern State. It has come into being, it's going to get an option to join the Free State or not, which the day after the Free State is established a year later, it opts out of. Sean McEntee, Belfast Catholic, mm -hmm. is the one who talks about partition. Mm -hmm. And he's very eloquent about it. And he says, interestingly, that he's going to vote against the treaty because of partition, not because of the oath. Mm -hmm. That's a fascinating philosophical moment. But it's also... Fascinating to me that everyone else, more or less, lets it go uh, and says, well, the Boundary Commission will fix all this. God bless them and their mm. innocence. Of course it didn't fix it and mm. never was going to. But that habit is deep buried in the state. And among, no, let's not say in the state, among our politicians. We have a crisis in 2000. Oh, the Troika will come in and fix it. We're always handing over responsibility to, to elsewhere and to otherwhere. And that, that's deep died. How do you deal with an intractable problem? You close your eyes, whistle it to yourself and keep walking, not looking. I mean, the, the fact that, you know, the Republicans have an idea of an all-Ireland Republic, and why not? I'd love to live in one myself. Yes, well, we all would, except but for a million have, people in the North. You have what, what McEntee describes as a fortress of orangeism. Now, it's not going to be wished away. Mm -hmm. It can't be confronted militarily because you would have a, a one-sided civil war. As I say, you come back to the Larne gun and 100,000 rifles, you know? Plus, that's without the British themselves getting even formally involved. So you can't wish it away. You have to deal with it. And even now, right in the present moment, there are those who think that if we have a referendum and declare a united Ireland, that it'll happen all by itself. And the, the problem is that while I would love to live in an all Ireland Republic, simply because it makes rational and emotional sense not. that this island of peoples could fend for it very well for itself as the heartland of the former British Empire continues to decay. Uh, I think it would be pragmatic as well as lift our spirits to, and we have so much to learn from each other. But it's not going to happen by wishful thinking. No. And the tragedy of the Republican side the more extreme elements of the Republican side in the treaty debates is they just project it forward, they project the unity of the island forward into some never-never land and there is not a single pragmatic suggestion as to how Here's it can be brought about. Thing. But neither, neither do the free state side yeah. have any real no. proposals for the unified. No, they're both at one in the sense that they both, both, both sides there's still the Republican original Sinn Féin party voted in in 18 and 21. But then none of them have any pragmatic suggestions. And I think, I keep thinking, it comes back to the refusal to actually think through what should a republic be. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's an argument that republicanism is in effect uh, uh, emanates from Protestant refusal of rule from outside. You know, yeah. you could you could argue well, of you that could. philosophically, what was Wolf told? Republicanism is a Protestant yeah. invention. Yeah. It's a secular version of a Protestant mind. Yeah. Well, Protestantism is far more um, friendly to the idea of republicanism than mm. Catholicism is. Mm. Remember, the Reformation was precisely about getting rid of central control from mm. the Vatican. Mm. Catholics kept that. Even the Counter Reformation kept that. It's not necessarily uh, a delightful prospect for Catholics. Mm. 
Mm. Protestants are far more likely to, to be interested in mm. the Republican ideas. have a idea. kind of philosophical foundation for thinking. Historically about speaking, that yes. all changes as time goes on. Ah, well, yeah. But speaking again of McEntee and the North, McEntee goes on to be a minister in de Valera's government mm. in the 1930s. Throughout the 1930s, Dev is doing exactly what Collins said could be done. He's dismantling the treaty, mm. the stepping stone to freedom, ending with the 1937 Constitution, and then with the 1938 Anglo-Irish talks, where he gets everything he wants from the British. He gets the ports back, arguably a very stupid thing for the Brits to do, mm. with World War II about to with break out. With the Atlantic convoys needing cover. He gets an end to the land annuities, a huge victory. He gets a huge free trade agreement, but he doesn't get partition. Mm. And McEntee writes him a letter, he's on the delegation for those talks, saying, you cannot coerce a million Protestants into a united Ireland. Why should you? Stop banging on about partition. You're not going to get it, you know you're not going to get an end to it. Mm. So I will resign if you don't shut up. Now, he didn't send the letter because McEntee was always writing resignation letters and not sending them. But we have them on file so we can see what he was thinking. And it's fascinating to me that, that McEntee is a version of Seamus Mallon, many years ahead of his time. And he describes the Belfast Agreement as Sunningdale for slow yeah, learners. Exactly. Yeah. And also, don't try the 50.1% majority thing. Mm. That won't work. It's hearts and minds stuff here. McEntee, as a Belfast Catholic, understood that. And he, to me, he's one of the most interesting characters in the whole pantheon of, of the treaty debaters. And, and Shanti O'Callaghan. Shantio. It's a very interesting area. Yeah. But well, remember, he is the man who watered down the democratic program for the first thought. The, the very last session of the debates is extraordinarily moving and dramatic, um, where we get de Valera getting increasingly hysterical, realizing that that power is slipping from his fingers in this situation, thinking that his rhetoric might have got him to a point where he can achieve victory and slowly beginning to realize that he's not. Arthur Griffith really saves the day for the, the, the treaty side with a magnificent speech that it is so great that it has been reinstated in this production that people get to see what an interesting and intelligent and clever person Arthur Griffith was. Um, and what he's arguing is you have to represent your constituents Many of you went home for Christmas and talked to them, and you know what they said to you. And those cries of no, no, no from all around the house. It is true, nonetheless, that that happened. And that this is the democratic forum for the country, and there will be an election in due course. And in his view, people are going to support the treaty overwhelmingly. Turns out to be absolutely correct about that. Um, but he's also appealing, particularly to de Valera, uh, saying, you keep saying you sent us over to get a republic. Back to your point, what is a republic? We told you we couldn't do that. Lloyd you George had told De Valera in advance yes. of sending yeah. the delegation. It wasn't the correspondence that. between De Valera and Lloyd George yeah. right through August is, is people going in different directions past each other. Mm. Dev keeps talking on about a republic, and Lloyd George says you can't have it. So Griffith is, is saying, look, we did the best we could, given instructions from yourself and from other people here in the Doyle, we went across and got the best we could get short of a republic. And there's a big discussion about that whole business of what is short of a republic. Was Harry Boland being sent to America to prepare the Irish Americans for something short of a republic? John Cronin plays de Valera magnificently, and you can see him starting to disintegrate. And indeed, at the, the end, when he says, really tragically, the whole world is looking at us now, he starts to cry. And that actually happened, and it must have broken. It's, loads it's, of in, it's in the stenographer's notes it in is. the debate. He At this point, down. Deputy De Valera broke down yeah. in tears. And, we oh, have, and when I came to oh. that, I was really struck. I know. Because you keep having to remember they all meant well for Ireland. They did. All of them, without exception. Their sincerity is beyond reproach. And, and that's sun. something we learn from this production. And where it really comes through, at the end of the production, and I think it was a stroke of genius on the part of the director who shall remain nameless, Louise Lowe, um, the silence stretches out. And they're looking at each other. And they're being realized, oh my God, we are going to, we could be killing each other. And Collins and Dev have a moment, which I'm sure absolutely convinced is correct. And they look at each other with love and bewilderment and sorrow. Well, the last thing Colin says is this. the president still holds the same, same position place in, my in my heart, heart that he always And had. De Valera replies, and you are yeah, mine. That's right. I mean, it's heartbreaking. It really it does. It is. Yeah, I mean, break your heart. I mean, why, why not say it? It's my yeah. emotion. But you know, 
we're left there with the long silence in our own thoughts yeah. and many of us our own tears yeah. as we think of our poor country. Yeah. And I had, I had a sudden memory of in 1966, and this is in the RT archives, Ernest Blyde and Sean McIntyre in, are interviewed and asked about the democratic program. And I really wish everybody would go and just look it up online, it's accessible, read it and see the vision that we could have of ourselves still. And Blythe says, oh, we all saw it as more or less the running up of a flag. No one had any serious intention of implementing it. And McEntee says, I do not think the workers would have believed in our bona fides and the farmers wouldn't have stood for it. So right at the heart of the state, you, and it, coming out of the treaty debates, you have one faction who say, we will not accept the legitimacy of Doyle Aaron. We derive our authority from armed insurrection in 1916, and we are committed to establishing the Republic by armed struggle. Yeah. That's one side comes out. Out of it comes um, a government that is prepared to murder four prisoners of war in reprisal for the murder of the TD Sean Hales. And out of it comes the absolute cynicism of a government which unanimously adopts a policy it has no intention of implementing. And is it any wonder that our state, our pitiful little state, still does not command the full trust and allegiance of the Irish people? Because there are flaws in the foundation and we need to face them and we need to remedy them and we need to remake ourselves. And I do believe that a new constitution, one which starts by defining my republic as a republic, allows us to build out, and, and I would say hope for my own part, hopefully, build out a republic, a secular republic which will encompass the whole island, which is not nationalist, which I despise as it is, but which is based on the people above the ground and not on memories and distorted fabrications about the men and women beneath the ground. And it's all to play for. We can start again. Nothing is forever. The treaty was not forever. Nothing is forever. We are not irrevocably committed to a closed-in future. It's ours to make. We can ask the questions. What is to be done? Who do we want to be? It's a terrible pity you weren't present at the treaty debates themselves, my friend. The, the terrifying so thing eloquent. About, the terrifying thing about this production is I was having to force <laughs> myself not to join in and say, no, you're wrong. And, and that's the beauty of immersive theatre. I've had this experience before with a new production. I have to tell myself, shh, shh, shh. Sit there, sit there, you're not to join in, you know. <laughs> and that's, again, back to the Greek tragedy, where you are intimately involved in it, because it is your life being enacted out there in front of you, you know. I'm surprised. I mean, I have to say, I was tempted for just a moment, except I kept reminding myself, this is a very fine actor, mm. to go give Seamus Robinson a dig when he said those terrible things about Michael Collins. There's you could feel the passions yeah. in the audience. They are the passions, and they're there. Well, look, I, I honestly think we have been in, when I say we, I mean me and all the other people who have got to see this incredible production. Me included. Have been extraordinarily privileged yeah. uh, to see the fruits of the work that you and Louise and that amazing cast and all the crew have done to bring this astonishing moment to life for us. And to call back the ghosts. To call back the ghosts. To call back the ghosts and do what we can to bring them rest yeah. by committing ourselves again to what they were prepared to die for. Well, they were treated with the utmost respect and dignity in this production. They got everything they deserved in terms of representation, accuracy, beautiful surroundings. Owen Boss, Bula Boss, I say, look at this, it's just extraordinary, back to where it, it looked like in 1921-22. In and Theo, congratulations to uh, you on doing such an amazing job on the script. I just dug because the it is magnificent. I just dug the trenches and who built the, the <laughs> fortress. <laughs>